Yes. Enjoyed this very, very much. Thank you. Who are you filming me for? I'm filming you for my blog, if that's okay with you. Okay, we'll and talk. I'll be happy to send you links. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you show, like, the whole thing? Like, um, <laughs> I just okay. ended it after what you just said about Hollywood, okay. in case you asked me not to right. put that okay. on the Internet. Right. Um, so, yeah. What's the uh, question? So the question is... Um, I'm in the process of uh, writing a review of this book, and I think the title of my review is going to be, Is It Just Me, or Is Jonathan Tropper Preoccupied with Death a Little Bit? Well, is that a question? It is a question, <laughs> because um, you're sort of looking at it from several different angles in your last, at least three novels, <coughs> and I think it's kind of interesting, but I'm, I, I love what you do with the, the comedy and the tragedy, and but it's interesting, and, and I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that. Well, I mean, I think, I guess everything's about death, um, to some extent. Um, I mean, if you, yeah, I, I guess, yeah, I mean, it's, it's if you're writing about, um, you know, men beyond a certain age, you know, I guess if you're writing about people in their 20s, maybe it's a little more about sex, but, you know, it's... Uh, I mean, that's, I mean, the, the clock of your mortality is what moves you, and, and the fact that these men at various stages later in life are, are having belated uh, coming of ages or, or are discovering decisions that they've made are not serving them well, the whole pressure is that you don't have forever to get it right anymore. You know, when you were a teenager, when you're in your 20s, you know, you can screw up all over the place and still kind of rebuild your life, but once you're in your late 30s and 40s and 50s and you've assembled a family and, and responsibilities in a life and you start screwing things up, uh, you don't have forever to fix that. And so I think mortality plays a huge... It, mortality is basically the ticking clock in any in any story. Um, so if, if that's what you mean, then yeah, I do, I guess, concern myself with death to some extent. Yes. Okay. Yes? I've only read uh, This Is Where I Leave You. It seemed to me that Judd, that the women in the book were all um, less developed than the men in terms of their character. It seemed like they were mainly tits and ass, um, and they didn't seem as um, well developed as the men. And I wasn't sure whether that was because you were trying to see it from his perspective, whether that was a conscious choice. Or whether I suck as a writer. <laughs> right. Well, I, I hope you won't be offended when I say you might bring a little baggage to that point of view. Um, but in some cases, yeah, Judd is um, Judd is going through a. Um, he has just his wife's been sleeping with his boss for fourteen months, and he just found out about it. So he's been stripped of pretty much everything that he feels makes him a man. Uh, he lives in the suburbs. He's lost in the same moment. He lost his wife, his job, and his house. So if you live in the suburbs without a wife, a job, and a house, what are you doing? You know, and um, and because of that, he is, in many bad ways, searching for his manhood. And his point of view of every woman he meets is highly sexualized because of that. Um, at the same time, though. I don't think anything about his sister Wendy is tits and ass. I don't think there's any discussion of her tits or ass. I think it's really about who she is as his closest sibling and, and his friend. And I don't think she is sexualized at all in the book. I think his mother is, interestingly enough, not sexualized at all because of the fact that she is so ridiculously overtly sexual, you know, to the kids. Um, but yes, he is looking at every, and I actually don't think Penny is terribly sexualized, but, but I do think you are right in picking up the undercurrent that he is looking at every woman he meets and sees as an object, because he's trying to figure out where he fits into the sexual pecking order now that he's been greatly emasculated and cuckolded by his wife. Um, so, yes. Um, right? So... Anyone else got anything they want to come? Yeah. Can you tell yeah. us? Sorry. Oh. oh. I'll get you in one second. Hi. Yes. Hi. I, I read the new book. Um, Good. And the, um, his, I, 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 Silver's rival of sorts, I, is, um, his wife's husband-to-be, he's a really good guy. Yeah. 
how did you why did you consciously do that well because you have to if you, i try to make everybody I don't, I don't like villains and i don't like heroes and i i like everyone to sort of be uh real and the fact is it would be too easy if she was marrying a jerk because if she's marrying a jerk then you're just going to root for silver to win her back but the fact is, she's actually marrying someone who every reader, and Silver himself, considers a better man than Silver. And that makes it much more interesting because he's still going to, in some ways, be Silver's nemesis, but you're not necessarily rooting for Silver in that case because Rich is a good guy who's just trying to hold this whole family together, and he's done such a better job than Silver's done. And to me, that was a much, it was a much more interesting dynamic to form a friendship between these two men where one has totally replaced the other and yet Silver can't bring himself to dislike this guy because the guy is just such a solid guy who's, who's served his family in every way that he couldn't. That just was a much more interesting relationship to me than, oh, she's marrying, you know, a dick. Like, you know, just... It's nice, so. it's nice to read about it. <laughs> Yeah, he's, uh, he's, he's a good guy. You know, yeah, he's he, the yeah. poor guy gets gets yeah. a lot more than he bargained for, yeah. but he's a uh, yeah. So yes. Yeah.